Welcome to On The Level, broadcasting from the Blue Ocean Network studios here in Beijing. My name is Fergus Thompson. Now, Autism Spectrum Disorder, ASD, or autism as it's variously known, is a much misunderstood and, for many parents, sometimes a much feared condition. Now, since the 1990s, a deluge of media reports about an increase in the prevalence of ASD, the so-called autism epidemic, has led to much wider public discussion of the disorder. But has this led to a better real understanding of the condition? And are these trends and misconceptions reflected here in China? Well, to look at some of the developments in ASD research and, importantly, the benefits uh, for those touched by ASD, I'm delighted to be joined in studio today by two top experts in the field. Uh, Thomas Bougeron is a professor at the University of Paris Diderot. He also works at the Pasteur Institute in Paris in autism research. And Professor Wei Li Ping is director of the Center for Bioinformatics at Peking University and also an investigator at China's National Institute of Biological Sciences, also based here in Beijing. Wei Li Ping, uh, Thomas Bruchon, welcome to On The Level. Thank you for having us here. Now, I mentioned three terms at the beginning of there, autism, ASD, autism spectrum disorder. Um, what are we talking about here? Is this the same thing, and, and what is the term in use today? And so autism is diagnosed for people who have problem in social interaction, so that's the first cr diagnostic criteria. Mm -hmm. The second one is the presence of stereotypy. They do the same signs on language. They have a problem in restrictive pattern of interest. So this kind of, there are the two diagnostic criteria for autism. Right. But are the terms used interchangeably, really, being like ASD and, and, and autism? ASD is a shorthand for autism spectrum disorder, so these two are equivalent. Um, so in the new diagnostic menu, uh, autism spectrum disorder is the official category of diagnosis. Right. Uh, autism is what people often use, and sometimes people use it to call the more classical and more severe type of uh, autism spectrum disorders. Right. Uh, and we, we still speak of autism often in in our research or when we, when we talk, but yeah. officially, I think, ASD is considered yeah. the official. What does that on the spectrum mean? Yeah, because it's very diverse. It's what we call also autism with a big S, you know, because it's, it could be very different from one child to another. In fact, there is a very famous uh, psychiatrist called Laura Wing. She said, when you see a child with autism, you have seen one child with autism. Because some, some really, they are very severe, where really really struggling, and some, they can be very, you know, talented people, and uh, on TV you can mostly, most of the time you see the talented uh, uh, people with Asperger, with Asperger's syndrome, but you don't right. see the very severe one. Right. And I've, this is a really a, a spectrum, and what is amazing is that the, the genes that we found are also affecting the same, I mean, the, the, the same genes are affecting the more severe cases and also the, the less severe. How does a, a, a physician or a doctor or somebody make the diagnosis uh, of, of somebody having it? Is, it? is it only through behavior or is there some sort of a, a physical marker or, or, or physical symptom? Right now, there are no physical markers uh, that are used in diagnosis. Uh, even though different children may have their own uh, physical uh, uh, disorders, dysfunctions as well. Uh, so right now, diagnoses are made by the two uh, main category of symptoms. The first is uh, uh, impairments in social interaction and social communication. The second is uh, repetitive behavior and restricted interest. And there are also three criteria that also have to be met. Uh, in addition to these two categories of core symptoms. And those three include um, the symptoms have to appear in early development. Um, and second is that uh, the symptom had to cause clinically significant impairments in multiple important areas of function. So that clearly distinguishes people with ASD from someone who's just introvert and don't want okay. to talk. And thirdly, uh, it also tries to separate ASD from other comorbid disorders. For instance, if um, uh, a child also has intellectual disability and the symptoms of autism, it's only diagnosed as having 
autism if its social function is way below its other uh, functions in other areas. In terms of numbers uh, of people affected in the general population, uh, Professor Bourgeron, in, in, in the United States and Europe, for example, uh, can you put a percentage or a one out of a hundred or some figure like that on it? Yeah, so in the 70s, it was, about, it was about one in a thousand, something like this, and, and now it's one, more than one in a hundred. One in a thousand down to one in a hundred yeah. from the 70s until now. That's, that's a huge climb. Yeah, huge. So several things can explain that. I mean, before really the more severe cases were, were diagnosed, before 2000, about two-thirds of the patients, they have intellectual disability. Now, after 2000, two-thirds of the patients, they don't have intellectual disability. So, so it's really changed the, the, the spectrum. So you're saying that the criteria of diagnosis mm. could certainly have an influence oh, on yes, that figure? Oh, yes, huge. Uh, obviously, before 1943, there was zero out of 100,000 because there were no diagnoses. Yeah, there. exactly. And in, in terms, is that the only explanation, do you think? No, the medical awareness also, it's huge, uh, uh, important. I mean, nobody was talking about autism before. And so if there was a child with intellectual disability, nobody was looking at the social interaction or the stereotypy. And now we are looking at that, and then we have a diagnosis of autism. So that's really important, and this, this is one of the major um, components that explain the variance of the, of the prevalence. W would those figures be similar in China, Professor Wei? Uh, so far, that has been known. National survey published. Uh, we know of two that are ongoing as we speak. And uh, we uh, heard that in this new study, the, one of the new studies they were conducting right now, uh, it's partly finished and among the partially finished uh, uh, sample, uh, they also found the prevalence to be uh, around 1% to 1.5. So that would mean in China we're talking about perhaps 14 million people, exactly. something like that. Exactly. In uh, terms of environmental factors versus innate, something, to explain it in simple words, you are born with it or you get it afterwards <laughs> this way. What is the current state of argument o over this, Professor Bourgeois? So there is clearly a genetic component. I mean, the, it was shown by twin studies or familial studies that the recurrence rate, if you have a, one child with autism, there are about 20% chance to have another child in the spectrum, which is huge. and. Um, and so the, the genetic component is high. It's you say component, though. Component. So that would suggest it's not the only factor. Yeah, I mean, for, it's really, again, it's for, for one child, something will be very genetic, yes. and the other will be very environmental. So there are, but what we estimate is that about 50%, more than 50% is genetics, and the, and the other component is, is environmental. But again, I mean, you have some kids where you know it's really genetics. I mean, a single gene can mm -hmm. do really, a, really cause autism. And for some kids, we don't know. I mean, uh, uh, until you find the gene, you don't know. So that's, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a in, tough question. In terms of in, when we talk about environmental factors, are there any that have been identified as possibilities uh, for that other 50%? Uh, one risk factor that has been replicated was uh, increased parental age. Um, uh, it had been found that when the parents' age increased by uh, 10 years, the risk of autism rises by about 50, 60 percent. And there have been some reports on pesticides, um, but they're yeah. conflicting. Yeah, it's very difficult to very, work environment factor. Very, very difficult. And there are factors that have been uh, ruled out uh, conclusively, such yeah. as mercury and uh, Vaccine. vaccines right. um, and the, these refrigerator are the factors that mother. These make news headlines because there's right. been so much talk yeah. about them in the past. Yeah. But these have been right. ruled out from. Yes. from yeah, the paper was retracted. Yeah. I mean, the first yeah. paper. Are there any populations or societies uh, in the world that show either a higher or a lower incidence that could be used to? to do further study into what might be behind it, whether it's genetic or environment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, the the main uh, population is male. Male, mm -hmm. they have four times mm -hmm. more chance to have autism than females. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so females are pro protected uh, factors for against uh, autism. Right. And uh, yeah, that's uh, and we do, still don't know why. Nothing in terms of of societies or groups around the world that that have a lesser or or a greater incidence of this that you know. If you look at the prevalence studies from the U.S., 
Usually they show that uh, African Americans have a lower uh, rate, but usually that's explained by uh, less access to care, exactly. not by anything fundamental. Well, well, speaking of care, if a diagnosis is made uh, at, at a reasonably early age, at the moment, what can be done? What is what is best practice? Right now, the the best practice for these children are intensive behavior interventions. For example, what's called ABA, the Applied Behavior Analysis. Uh, these uh, uh, are most effective when they are started early. So if the child is diagnosed early, for, ex for instance, before 18 months of old, uh, then uh, these early interventions are most effective and also they have to be intensive, meaning that the children, at least at the beginning, have to be taking the training at about five hours for five days a week and it has to go on for uh, six months and sometimes for people uh, 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 more severely affected mm -hmm. for years. Professor Bourgeon, uh, Matthew State of Yale Program in Neurogenetics, uh, speaking of you, said, I don't think there's anyone who had a more significant impact as an individual on where the field is today. Could you explain to us in simple terms, what was that impact? What was that discovery that you made back in 2003? So first, I'm, uh, I have to thank Matt you for, for the very uh, kind work. Um, so what I found, in fact, we knew that genetics was important for autism, but there were 20,000 genes, so mm. where, where to look at? And uh, in fact, I used very simple approach. I mean, uh, there was some part of your genome that sometimes are missing, okay, and uh, sometimes are duplicated. And in, in one region of the X chromosome, there was some people with autism, they miss one little copy of the X chromosome. And in that region, there was one gene that was really interesting because it was making contact between nerve cells that we call synapse. So I, I sequenced the gene. Uh, I was still working on the lab. I mean, I was mm -hmm. not uh, on the computer. I was working in the lab, and I found this mutation. So it was a stop mutation. So it, normally you have a, a gene that codes for a protein, and this protein will do something in your brain, like uh, making s contact between nerve cells. And this protein was shorter. And, in, and this protein was non-functional. And we found this mutation in one child with autism and his uh, uh, brother with Asperger syndrome. And that was the first time that we found this uh, very rare mutation um, in autism and also in Asperger syndrome. And that was the first time that it was linking the, the, the synapse, this contact between neurons, with autism. So this is a clear link of a gene or a, or a, or a problem with a gene causing yeah. this particular problem. If you're talking about these synapses, these are the, the parts that send messages from yeah. one, one cell to another. And um, there are, for ones that don't function possibly, some sort of drug treatments that do, do improve that function. Does that yeah. mean hypothetically that there might be a possibility down the road that there could be some treatment uh, that would improve that function? Yeah, pro probably. I mean, we are very bad in pharmacology of the synapse to yet, but it's very new. I mean, I found this gene in 2003, so, mm. I mean, we are... And now it's really amazing, I mean, because many, many researchers, geneticists, neurobiologists, bioinformaticians are taking these genes and, and they are trying now to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. And also, when I found this uh, gene, it was very rare family. And so in 2003, then I, in 2007, I found another gene that was binding to the other one. And then there is now a pathway, which is, so each child is different, but it was a different mutation sometime. But then they converge in some biological mechanisms that are the same. So one hope is to try to under, better understand what's going on with this synapse and trying to understand better how the autistic brain is working and and trying to understand the people and then to understand what they need. Professor Wei, your field is bioinformatics mm. and Professor Bourgeon was talking about sequencing genomes. These are huge amounts of numbers and information. Mm -hmm. Explain a little bit about bioinformatics and why that's so important to the sort of research that, that's been done uh, on ASD. Uh, so by definition, bioinformatics is the development and application of computer and computational technologies to study biomedical questions. So why do we need uh, computers in life science? That's because biology research is now generating big data. 
Um, for instance, the latest sequencing technologies can sequence one person's genome, your or my uh, whole genome in a day with less than one thousand mm. um, dollars. And uh, the amount of data we generate in a small set of experiment would fill uh, your whole laptop. And uh, one file would be so large that it can't be opened by Word or yeah. Excel. So how do we deal with this data? To store this data effectively, to manage them, to analyze them, we need advanced computer and computational tools. And this is what bioinformatics does. So this is the um, linking of, of, of computer engineering to what seems right. to be something very different, which is a life right, science. Right, because it's life science is becoming a data-intensive field. Uh, and there's uh, a lot of treasure hidden in uh, these data yeah. uh, that we want to get. And it's challenging in that, uh, like Thomas just uh, mentioned, uh, the human genome has three billion nucleotides, base pairs. Uh, so on computers, they're represented as three billion letters of ATCLG. And out of these three billion letters, probably only one uh, was uh, wrong, mm -hmm. or a few was wrong. And uh, between any two of us, we have about one million of our letters that are different, naturally. Um, so how do we find this yeah. one uh, letter that's wrong that may uh, contribute to autism out of these three billion letters? That's a very interesting, challenging, yet fascinating problem that we, we both face <laughs> and are working on. In, in looking, this is the, the, the computational side of it, and you're looking mm -hmm. at, the, at the genetic side of it, but you were, you were both involved in this intellectually and, and academically, mm -hmm. but also involved, from what I know, at a personal level. Mm -hmm. You go out to centers where uh, people with autism are, are, are living and, and getting treatment. Uh, I believe you've been doing that during your stay here, uh, Professor Bouchon. Um, when does it become personal? I, I think I, I first approached the... Uh children and families with autism from an academic uh, angle. I wanted to understand what was causing autism, how can we help them better. Uh, and in order to do our research well, we do uh, a lot of uh, uh, assessments uh, of these children and their parents. So we spend about a day with each mm -hmm. child and their family trying to learn what happened to the child and uh, uh, what are the parents like, what the child's current behavior and previous behaviors. So, you know, after a whole day with a family, uh, you, you know so much about them, and they, uh, we feel very close to them, uh, and we want to um, uh, help them. Uh, they, 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 they have been extraordinarily supportive and cooperative uh, of our work, uh, mm. but they often come up and say that uh, we support, uh, we believe research is important, but what about this child of mine right now, and what's going to happen when we mm. get old and when we die? And um, and this affects us. Uh, so so we have been uh, doing what we can uh, outside of work. Research is still. I still believe that fundamentally, in the end, it will be research that will help these children uh, yeah. fundamentally. But uh, while we're doing our research, we're still uh, doing. Um, things really to help the children and their families, such as uh, uh, running art exhibitions for children who do have artistic talents. And I think art is a great job for children with autism, because uh, the more different an artwork is, the more valuable it is. You don't have to conform to social norms, and you can do it in yeah. the privacy of your home as long as someone's willing to help you sell the artworks. So things like this. Uh, so you, you mentioned you were at an art exhibition today for, produced by, by, by children with autism. Uh, you also, I believe, visited a centre called Stars, Stars and, and Rain, Rain which, mm -hmm. which you have worked with. This is not a government centre, is it? This is a, a This is a non private, private non-profit centre. Yeah. Uh, so there are about 1,000 autism training centres uh, in China. So after the children are diagnosed in a hospital, uh, the, uh, very few hospitals provide behavior training for the children. So they come to these uh, autism training centers. So there are about 1,000 such centers. Uh, over 90% are privately owned uh, um, 
and uh, uh, or nonprofit organizations. Only a small percentage are state-owned government centers. And uh, we recently did a, a survey of 100 of these centers. So it's not every center, but it's about 10% of mm -hmm. all the centers in China. Uh, we found that um, over 95% of them were founded after year 2000. Uh, and uh, over 60% of them were founded by parents who have a child with autism. Mm -hmm. uh, so often uh, the parents uh, had this, their, their children diagnosed and they found there's no service in their city or town. Uh, what do they do? So they want to train uh, their children. And uh, at the same time, they also include more children and they build a center out of this. So this is very common. Uh, Professor Richard, I know you, you, you haven't spent a lot of time in China, but you, you did visit one of these centers today, the uh, Stars in the Rain Center. H how did that measure up to what you have seen in, in, in your travels in Europe and in France? I think it's, it's fabulous. I mean, it, it's really like a team. I mean, it's a team you know, uh, work, I mean, uh, to work on autism. Uh, that's what I really like. I mean, uh, and uh, part of the team are the parents and the, mm -hmm. and the, and the children. And, uh, and I think what the, the Rain and Star have done is really amazing. I mean, uh, I've, I've, I'm, I was totally uh, moved by, by what I've seen. It was, uh, it was really, uh, I wish we could have such centers, more such of such center in France. That was, right, that's uh, high yeah, praise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned cooperation there. We have here a, a French scientist and a Chinese scientist both working together to the, to, towards this goal. How important is international cooperation in the field of ASD research? I think it's, it's so important. I mean, uh, first, it, I said it's a teamwork. So the, my work, I couldn't have done that work without the psychiatrist. I mean, the, the, uh, Christopher Gilberg in Sweden and, and Marion Le Boyer in France, they were there. I mean, they, they, were, they are the door of the, of the house, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I'm, I'm part of the house with, uh, as working with my genes and mm -hmm. trying to see what's going on. But they, they are, uh, it's really a teamwork. And, and, and when uh, uh, Liebing was, was saying that we are trying to find the, 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 the nucleotide, the, the mutation, uh, but we, sometimes we found the mutation, but we don't know exactly what's, what's going on because we know this China's autism, but we don't know what, what this mutation is doing in his brain, or what kind of autism he has. And so we need more information from everywhere. Around from, the world. Yes, from everywhere, from all over the world. And also, there are so many, you know, sequencing. And so, I mean, my brain cannot see all these genes. And, uh, and I need my, you know, the sequencing is so, you know, expensive that I want my sequencing to be seen by the eye of uh, Leaping Way. I mean, she will see things that I will never look at. And that's great. And this is really wonderful. So, so this and is not so, a field um, in which one or two people are going to no. make a sudden breakthrough and suddenly yeah. everything's going to be fine. It needs mm -hmm. collaboration from right. thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of scientists around the right. world. Right. And for, for human genetic studies, when you discover something in one population, you want that finding replicated in an independent, as different as possible, to, a, a, another population. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, for uh, autism, sometimes it's so complex and heterogeneous. Mm. So sometimes the signal is weak compared to the mm. noises in the background. So you need a large uh, sample size, what, what we say, meaning you need to study a large number of patients to begin to see the mm. patterns. And uh, that's why uh, you see a lot of collaborations across different groups and even And across. also to see how the different societies see people with autism and to include more people with autism in our society. Mm -hmm. This is really important because I really am I'm doing, I'm finding genes for autism, I'm doing animal models, so you can make m mice that have the mutation with the, the genes and they, it's really amazing our they have social interaction mm -hmm. is, is a problem in mice when they have this mutation. They can vocalize less. You don't, I don't know if you know that mice can sing, but they, they, they can sing in your ultrasound. And, and when you do this mutation, they reduce their vocalization. So it's really recapitulating. Some, and they are grooming a lot, and so like a stereotype. So it's, you can do this such a thing and, and, and trying to find a pill that will maybe, you know, alleviate the... But I think this is the more important is to include people also. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe, maybe doing a, making a pill to help them 
but really to, to also to include more the people in, the, in our society. Professor Bourgeon, I'll ask you first, what, what do you see, what, what advances will we see over the next 10 years in terms of ASD, both, both research and, and, and possible treatment? Or? Yeah, I think we will know more and more. I mean, they're, 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 the technology is growing, growing and the sequencing is there. Mm -hmm. There is much more collaborative work to, to look at this. So this is, I'm, I'm sure we'll know more about autism. But the problem we will know about autism, and, I, and, I, and in fact, autism is so diverse that mm -hmm. I think it will be really important to get an idea of very, you know, very in-depth phenotyping, and what we call yeah. phenotyping, it's exactly what are you saying when you say autism. Because to find one gene for autism, I don't know what autism is, even if I found a gene, you know. So I need to see if the child has hypersensory problem or if he has a sleep problem. So because this person is a, an individual before to have autism, you know. And, and I think that's, that's, that's really important for me, I mean, in the future. We have to be, it could be dangerous to find one gene for autism and what do you see, what, what do you do, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that it's one gene for maybe for too much hypersensory a problem, so maybe we have to calm this, and uh, maybe for sleep problem, then you have to, you know, take care of sleep. So because most of the time, people with autism are considered like a page in a book, you know, like a, like a disease. Right. So, and so it, you're not. It, it's not going to be one simple answer. It's yeah, going to be and uh, and and also, I mean, I always say that when you have autism, you are protected from a lot of problems because <laughs> you you don't have a tooth problem if you have autism. You know, if you cry, it's because you have autism. You know, and people don't care about if they have. So I think this is awful, and I, I think in the in the future, what what I think I hope my work can can provide and my the teamwork is to better understand the, the person and to and to to give this person to the possibility to be you know to to have a better life, and if he doesn't want to speak, well, I don't care. So I mean, really, if he doesn't want to speak, but if he wants to 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 have more social interaction, why not? And, and, and to have more more inclusive world. So in I some think ways you really feel maybe, maybe the, the improvements will not be with the, 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 the people um, with autism, but in yeah. the views of society yeah. towards those people. Yeah, it's funny because we now we can track the, I mean, it's our little society, but it's mm -hmm. a mouse. We can, we, can, we can track the mice, you know, and we could see that the, the, the normal mice was behavior, the, the behavior was different when there was a, a, a mutant mouse. And a, so your behavior is different when you have someone with autism. And I don't care, I mean, I, it's really great to have a different, but it's, you have to include the, the, the people. And that's my credo. Diversity. Yes, exactly. And Professor Wei, um, if you had a magic wand, what <laughs> advance would you like to see, whether it has to do with attitudes or something advanced in science uh, over the next 10 years? I do want to see a magic pill that's being developed. Uh, I don't believe that uh, a child with autism will be able to take a pill and suddenly get better. Mm. But I do believe that eventually there will be medicine that the children can take that will make it much easier uh, for others to teach them. So the intensive behavior training now that uh, 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 that that children have to take for five hours a day, five days a week for two years. Maybe with a magic pill, they <laughs> only need to just go to regular school and get the mm. same uh, uh, amount of improvement. Mm. Mm. Um, so you still, like with uh, typical children, if you don't teach them, you don't, don't give them education, they're not going to uh, mm. know much. Uh, with children with autism, still, you need to teach them and still probably mm. a little more than with the uh, how you teach typical children, but I do hope and I do believe that someday there will be mm. a magic pill that makes it so much easier to teach them for the message to get into their head, for them to be more socially receptive yeah. of the cues, uh, um, so that... Uh, well, mm. Diversity, that and that optimistic view on, on, on pharmacological advances. Mm. Uh, Professor Wei Li Ping, Professor Thomas Bourgeon, thank you very much for coming on the level. Thank you. Thank you.